George, how you doing, man? Good. How you doing, Eric? Good. I'm glad. Uh, thank you for doing this. Yeah, not a problem. It should be fun. So you uh, you went on a hunt. Yeah, I just got back from uh, Montana. I was doing a little pheasant hunt with a couple of buddies of mine. Uh, ended up being quite the task because there was 15 inches of snow on the ground with drifts, you know, sometimes over your head. So it made it a, a true hunt. You had to work for them pretty hard, but we had a great time. Yeah, well, those are the ones you remember, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. And this one won't be forgotten. So where, where does GA start? You know, what, what's... You know, what, um, what makes that happen? Well, you know, I was a police officer a long time ago and my wife had a good job and she decided to go back to school. And of course my police officer pay wasn't going to cut the mustard for paying the bills. So I just started playing around with guns on my own. You know, I shot high power and, you know, I knew a little bit about guns and what made them work. And kind of like you, you started out in, in the shooting sports as well. And, uh, started learning from people you know marty bortson had just left dakota arms and came to town and he owns badger ordinance and makes a lot of cool parts and myself and him would travel around the country seeing what the marine corps the army amu robar at the time being it was that long ago kind of watched how they were doing stuff and you know started doing stuff on my own and built high power m16 ar types and m14 rifles for two or three years and then started building bolt guns and you know that was 1997 and now you know 24 years later we pretty much just do bolt guns and and do a lot of stuff for the law enforcement military side as well the interesting part is is uh you know you started with ars and now you mainly bolt but you were a police officer and now you do a lot of work with them correct yeah yeah and that and that helped it was helpful too you know being on the inside of the of law enforcement and building guns at the same time there was a lot of trust with those guys to go with us being that i was you know still an active cop at the time so eventually it got big enough you know from just me to to me and one other guy and then me and about four guys uh, at the shop and i finally decided well as soon as i can retire i'm going to i mean i most cops do 30 years i end up only doing 20 but uh, got out and started doing GA full time and it's worked out well, you know, met a lot of great people in the industry and have a lot of good customers and never kind of been worried about the company. It's always done, you know, I always worried about getting more employees and be able to get more parts, but I haven't really worried about the company at all. So, well, that just shows that you have a good reputation and, and that comes from good product. Correct. Yeah. And, yeah. And with the, advent of the internet you know the internet was nothing when i started it was you know email chat groups there weren't any forums now if you've if you've done your customers bad it gets out to the public instantaneously right. you know back when it was only telephones you know guys could call their buddies and warn them but now if you if you didn't let the community down everyone hears about it pretty much the moment it happens so there's no room for error there's no room for not taking care of your, of your customers in today's world so that's kind of a, a cornerstone of what what we do at, at GA anyway. Yeah. So what what would you say? Because I mean, I've heard from many people that own your rifles, and I've seen. You know, I mean, I I'm I'm on social media quite often, and I see people posting groups from your rifles, and they're just like benches quality groups. Like what what where does that come from? Is it is it Technique, parts, all all of the above? I would say if I had to put numbers to it, be honest, 30% of it's probably technique. There's there's pretty much everyone that's in the business is doing things really similar. Um, the quality of the barrel is probably paramount. I mean, being, I did some testing back in the day of taking like the, the worst condition Spanish Mauser, you know, that, was in five battlefields and just took it apart and cranked a bar line barrel on it. And that thing shot pretty much half inch. I mean, I didn't do anything to it. You know, the chamber was straight and the crown was good. And, and that, that gun shot really well. Um, you could take a really crappy barrel and stick it on a, a bat model B and it's going to still shoot like crap. So 
Um, I would say the barrel is probably paramount and the most important thing of the whole build. Um, and then secondary, uh, you start at aligning all the other really good parts with it that that make for a good gun and get a super super straight chamber in it that aligns with the bore head space is you know not outside of a couple thousandths and you're going to have a stick that shoots really well um you know with the advent of all these chassis beddings i wouldn't say going the wayside but you know if you're putting it into a wood stock or a or a, a stock that's not super hard and fitting right you know bedding is also really really important especially you know shot to shot and when the weather changes a little bit but i'd say most importantly and i know you probably already know this is the barrel is going to be the most paramount thing on that on that rifle for as far as it's shooting we, we call it the three b's brass yeah. barrels and bullets if you can handle yeah. those three you're going to have a pretty good chance of having a, a good shooter yep 100 percent. and you just called it out the reloading side of it's paramount too but now Factory ammunition nowadays is pretty good. I mean, we have uh, we have some rifles. The the we call it the six five needs more. We went and bought two six hundred dollar rifles, and we we started shooting them and trying to upgrade on them and see what would make a difference. And we were shooting that uh, Burger factory ammunition the whole time. Yep. And that stuff shoots. Oh yeah, the, um, Burger being you know in the industry of of building you know they, they're more on the competitive side of anything i mean they, they do do some hunting stuff but they've always been on the competitive side of things uh, i'm assuming if they do ammo they're going to build it in the same quality as they have their bullets from competitive and that goes across the board i mean any of the companies that are building ammunition for competition whether it be federal hornady and burger any of them they know how to make accurate ammo because they got test facilities and they do their own testing and Actually, I don't know if you are aware of this or if you've been in saw most boat manufacturers, every time they do a lot, they put those bullets through the lab before they actually make the whole production run. So the bullets got to shoot the way the machine set up to make the bullet before they even press start and make, you know, half a million bullets. So it's not like they turn it on and just spit out bullets. They test them and, you know, pull bullets off the end of the line test them and if they're not shooting right they make a few tweaks and then they go down the lab shoot them for a group again and once they get that you know nice little one hole or they turn the machine on and let it run so yeah that's uh that's uh interesting and i'm glad that they do that because you know they they yeah uh hornady we also shot some hornady ammo through those rifles <laughs> what we did is we went to academy because you know i make tuners right so we put tuners on these things and they were shooting pretty good right off the bat with good ammo yeah. but people were saying well what about testing different ammo so we did we went to academy and we bought one box of everything that we could find in 6.5 creedmoor like we ended up finding like 10 different brands of ammo we bought all 10 of them came back and uh, the hornady match not surprisingly shot pretty damn good too you know yeah um, yeah they i think the biggest problem recently for all the companies you know they, they got a recipe just like all of us reloaders do and through the last three years when it's been so hard to get stuff it's been hard for them too i think a lot of consumers think all of good powder went to the manufacturers that's not necessarily true i know they had to to use powders that they weren't as familiar with for some of their match ammunition or even blend powders to get the right burn rates to, to be able to make ammo so you know, if your ammo in the last three years have been a little bit different, like there's a reason for it. I mean, they're struggling to get components just like everyone else. I think that's starting to change now. I think finally everything's starting to catch back up. Uh, powders are becoming more available. Heck, Cabela's had Vargan on the shelf last week here in Kansas City, which is telling me things are starting to get straight. So, yeah, I was, uh, I had Eric Trump last week on the podcast and he was telling yeah. me that he was on at a, uh, Bass Pro Shops. He said he walked in there and he, he always goes down the reloading aisle and he said he found 4,000 uh, CCI 450s. Yeah. It's just, like I said, it's just starting to get a little bit uh, a little bit back to normal and it would be nice in another year when it feels somewhat normal again. I mean, we never shut down during this whole thing, so from a work standpoint, I felt normal the entire time, but as a community and a, and a nation, I think we're finally back to normal as far as everyday business goes anyway yeah well there's still 
I mean, I you know, we I feel the same as you. We we just been just hammering down. Uh, you know, we're we're over here trying to grow, and you know, you know what it's like. You probably sure. remember what it's like. <laughs> yeah. Trying to trying to gauge the market is like, do we do we expand? Maybe you know, maybe don't go too fast. You know, what what if you know all all those what if what if what if? But but uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, components wise, people say, well, well, you're you know. You're in with Capstone. You 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 can get all the hell no. <laughs> yeah, no, it works like that. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm a, uh, you know, I shoot for Capstone. Uh, there you go. Look, I got my cup right here. But uh, nice. they, it's it's no different, right? If 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 they don't have product, they're not gonna make a run just for me. It's they just right. don't have product. That's just how it works. And I'm I was in the same boat as everyone else. I still am. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of capstones just down the road from, from me locally here in today. And, and I think the other half of it's what in Arizona somewhere, but right. Yeah. Make good stuff. It was a good combination of putting Lapua together with burger back when that happened. I mean, it, it kind of made sense. Yeah. Me and my yeah. The, uh, the, the beauty about uh, that burger ammo is when we got done shooting it, we had Lapua breasts. Fire farmed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, so, so you decide you're going to start building rifles because you know you need yeah. a little more income. And at what yeah. point you said at one point you decided, I'm, okay, I'm going to go full time. Um, what size was the company? What what made you decide this? This is so. This, just the, the sheer fact that like I, there was no doing both anymore. I was spending so much time at the shop building mm -hmm. rifles and would go to work getting i was a canine officer at the time getting the patrol car with my dog and be half falling asleep at the wheel you know didn't feel like i was doing myself or you know the department justice anymore you know i wasn't in a uh, unit where i had to be super proactive i was more reactive you know the officers would call me to come up and search cars or I'd respond to the schools in the morning and search lockers. You know, I had specific things to task to me, but you know, there wasn't, it wasn't against the rules for me to go out and stop cars and look for stuff on my own. It's just, it wasn't, it wasn't a necessity. And I surely wasn't doing that anymore. I just, you know, I was come, becoming the, the short timer, I guess, in my mind anyway. So at that point, I just thought, you know, it'd be best to just, go ahead and finish it. I, July, January 5th would, was the date I had to make it to in uh, 2005. So on the 5th, I, I left the department. I stayed on as a reserve actually for just a little bit until 2007. Uh, my, my department actually did away with the reserve program there for a while. And so I left it because they, they absolved it, but mm -hmm. Um, I still work with a lot of the police departments. You know, I have a, a big gun range out here. Um, they come out and use it. I lend them a hand, especially with their sniper teams. Um, of course, being local to all these guys, I built the, the sniper rifles for pretty much every department in the Kansas City metro area and surrounding. Um, so I get to work with a lot of those guys. You know, I don't, I don't miss it, but I mean, they still stop by the shop. Heck, all the guys that I was, you know, training or, or were young guys when, when I was there, one of them's like my sergeant when I left is now the chief of police at the mm -hmm. department. So I see him, talk to him quite a bit. It's uh I, I could say I miss those days. I wouldn't want to do it again because I know what I know what kind of crap they have to deal with these days. So it's it, that wouldn't be my cup of tea, I don't think anymore. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. What okay. size was GA precision when you when you finally uh went full time oh, you're gonna make me think i, I want to say it was, it was myself eric reed chris matthews and um huh i want to see if I, wanna, I think roach was probably there and um and jeff hayes so it would have been four four and, and me so five of us at the time and, uh okay so it's already jeff, pretty large huh yeah and a lot of guys have spun out of my shop. You know, Jeff Hayes has a, a rifle shop of his own, River Bend Gunworks here locally in Weston. He does a, a lot of general gunsmithing, but does a rifle or two as well. Um, 
actually take that back. It would have been five of us. Tim Roberts was with me as well at that time. And Tim spun off. He runs a company called Crescent Customs, uh, another gun shop. Chris Matthews started a gun shop, but I think he let it fold. Now he drives trucks or something. Mm -hmm. um, Eric's retired completely. He's a few years older than me. He's just, I think he's living on retirement time now. And uh, Tim, we call him Roach. In fact, half the time I can't even remember his real name, but Tim, he uh, he works for the Mac Brothers up in Sturgis making actions and suppressors now. Actually, he's probably like the shop manager there. So I've had quite a few guys that got their start at GA and now are, you know, doing big things for big companies or, or started their own. So, which is always a problem. You get a really good gunsmith that works for you you always kind of have that want to, to do it yourself. So. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, I was in construction for many years and I'd get people in and teach them everything and then they go on their own. And, you know, I, you just, I, I always looked at it. Like I had two choices. I could either teach them and they left or not teach them and they stayed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I got, I got a really good crew now. Um, I got, we've, we've changed a lot. I mean, back in the day, every gunsmith started with, you know, a barrel and action and a stock and they had that gun from start to finish. And I still think that'd be a good position for companies to have. But when you get, when you start getting bigger and, and the production, like almost semi productions there, it's better to have guys that specialize. Like, so I got guys that run the machines and do chambers better than anyone in the shop. And those are the guys that run the, the machines. I got guys that have been bed. Like I have one guy that's been bedding for me for almost 20 years now. Like he's, he beds better than I ever did now. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't hold a candle to him. And so I got three guys that do bedding and they all are super good at it and they enjoy it. Um, I got a guy that's probably the best finish guy I've ever had in the shop in there now, um, as far as speed and quality the finish room was always hard to keep up with. That was where the slowdown always was, is just getting the guns through Cerakote and finish work. And then a lot of guys, I'm not sure if you've ever met Americ, but Brian Sykes, he left uh, seventh group special forces as a sniper instructor. He came to me and he does, he kind of works our range and does instruction for our clients, but he also does the final assembly at our shop in the QC, I guess the first level of QC. Um, once he test fires and specs and puts them in the vault and, our production manager goes in there and gives them a second inspection and, and initials off on them. But we kind of got a, a pretty good way now of guys that have really shown themselves in either, you know, machining, bedding, assembly, finishing, doing what they do best. And, you know, tw 20 years ago, I would have said it was still better to have one guy go all the way through. And, it, and to some degree it is because if there's a problem, you know, exactly who did it. But the same thing goes. I mean, if there's a problem with a chamber, you go to the chamber guy. If you go have a problem with the bedding, I know who to go talk to. So I think that it's worked out well. And we got guys that are really good at what they do, doing what they like to do. So, yeah. So again, back to the, you know, my, my, my past life of being a general contractor, that's, that's how you build a home. You, you don't, you don't have this. Some, some builders actually do choose to do that. They build a, the, the whole thing from the ground up. But when you start getting larger, I mean, we were doing 15 houses a year. So yeah. you can't you can't do 15 houses from the ground up, you know, start yeah. to finish. So, you know, you, you, you call the, the electricians and then you the plumbers and then the AC guys. And they all have their specialty, right? And then they come sure. in and they knock it out. And like you said, if there's an issue, you know who to call because sure. there was only one Save person. It. And if you get a plumber that screws a job up, you don't use him again. Nope. You find get rid of good. him. Yep. Yeah. And and yeah, so that's uh that's the you know, that's how it's done, you know, in construction, the same as what sure. you're doing. And and you actually end up with a better product just because yeah. that's what they do. They don't have to worry. You know, for example, they're not all gonna like for me, for myself, I I like chambering barrels. I hate betting. Yeah. You know, so if, if I came and then you said, look, you're going to change your barrels. Perfect. But you're also going to bet. Ah, oh, shit. I would hate those days. <laughs> Seriously. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, betting is what like kind of an artwork. I mean, if you like playing with clay and molding and stuff like that, you'd be a betting guy. Cause that's like, kind of like, you know, it, there is an art form too. And it's one of the hardest things I believe to learn in the shop. Like machining um, is also very 
particular in how you do it, but once you got it, it's the same thing. The setup's the same, you know, truing in the barrel on the to the machine is the same. Bedding, depending on the different actions and different stocks, it could be different every time you, you know, put one in your vice. So I think maybe those guys like the challenge of of the everything being different all day long, or at least for the most part. Possibly. I, I don't know what it is that they like, but more power There's to not, them. I think it's funny. I mean, that you mentioned that. There's a lot of shops now. Like, so when I was in business, when I started in business, there was very few shops like mine. I mean, I can name them. There, there's two or three still left in business, and a lot of the rest of them have all retired. But like Terry Cross down in Louisiana, he does what we do. He's, you know, builds great guns and has for a long time. He was in business when I started. Um, there's a number of them that have gone now. Um, I think micro, well, I know macro signio attack ops out in California is still around. There just wasn't that many. Now there's literally hundreds of guys building guns. And I was talking to manners the other day, not to knock on any of them, but most of them know how to do the machine work and nothing else. I mean, literally almost nothing else. None of them know how to bed. So they won't, We usually use a, a stock that has to be better. They always buy something that has to be a chassis. And a lot of them sell pre-fit barrels for actions that have known headspace and, and tenon length. Um, and they can make a good living doing this stuff, but they're not really true gunsmiths. They don't know a lot of the things that gunsmiths should know, I guess would be the best way to put it without sounding like I'm being a dickhead. But Well, so I learn betting just on my own from the internet whatever and i betted rifles and then one day i i just hated it and i thought well maybe i'm doing it wrong so i called up speedy and i said hey teach me how to bet rifles he said come yeah. on so i went up there he taught me how to bet rifles and i'm like yeah i just don't like betting rifles yeah. <laughs> so, so i i know how to do it i mean i learned from speedy and yeah. still when i bet a rifle needs to be betted i i just go drop it off i'm like just let me know when it's ready <laughs> and I got to give a shout out to Speedy too because he did me a solid back in the day too. I, I, you know, of course knew him from shows and going to shoots, and you know, he Speedy's a man and has been for a long time. But when he worked at Trinidad there for a while, I called him up. And I said, "Man, I don't know if anyone's ever asked you to do this, but like, can you call me when you got like really good students that that, that really need to be hired and want a job?" And I got a lot, a lot of my really good guys through Speedy's knowledge and you know sending them sending people my way. So. I do owe Speedy a bit of gratitude for for doing that. And it's kind of ironic. One of the guys he sent me, one of the better guys I've ever had, you know, worked for me for about five years. And now he's running that. He's got that same position Speedy had at that same school. <laughs> wow. But yeah. Yeah. So. Speedy's the man, man. He loves teaching. Uh, he loves uh, he loves when his students do well, because that just yeah. shows that his knowledge is, is, is working, you know, knowledge that yeah. somebody else Part, at least in part passed on to him and he, he just really likes doing things like that yeah he does good dude for sure yeah so i think i think you know the longer you've been in this and speedy would tell you this is like you always pick stuff up i mean you pick stuff up from people you never have thought to pick stuff up from maybe they you know thought outside the box one day and picked picked up some little trick that no one had ever thought of before and the guys in this business that are steadfast, this is the only way to do it. I would never do it any other way. They're kind of cheating themselves because I've, I've changed the way I do things over the years. You know, I've learned from people like Speedy and, and different gunsmiths that do things a little bit differently. And I've tried it and I'm like, man, you know, this is done. And now I understand why they do it that way. It's it, it either saved time or came out with, a, you know, the end result was a little bit better. And uh, I think, you know, as a shop or as a group of gunsmiths thinking together, you ended up coming up with processes that, that, you know, outdo older ways. So I, uh, I had Speedy here, oh, about two weeks ago and yeah. he was talking about how, I mean, you know, he chambers tons of barrels and sure. he said, he goes, you know how sometimes you, you know, after he checks every chamber after he chambers it for run out and everything. And yeah. he says, you know how sometimes you just get the little wiggle and it's it's not enough to matter but 
there's every now and then you have the chamber where it's just perfect. Like it won't wiggle at all. You put the 50 million indicator on there and he goes, it, it wasn't wiggling at all. That it was like the perfect chamber. He goes, and I run across those every now and then. So he went on this journey to make them all the same. So he, he chamber and try some different and write it on the back of a, he has this print, you know, with headspace and all the dimensions and on the back, right. he started writing all the process and he do one and, you know, document the results then he tried something slightly different finally he 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 hit it and now he's he told me now they're all perfect like just no wiggle and uh i said okay well what did you do he said oh I'm, that's uh, i'm gonna have to keep that one for myself i said all right fine <laughs> so uh fast forward about two weeks and i'm chambering some barrels that you know the world championships coming up so i'm chambering some barrels and uh I said, hey, Speedy, I know on the podcast you said you're going to have to keep that one for yourself, but, you know, you know, I got the world championship coming up, and, and when I win, I will say, I will I will thank you from the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, fine, but you have to promise you're not going to share this with anyone. I said, I will promise you. He goes, I better not fucking see a video next week on, on how this is done. <laughs> I, said, I said, don't you worry. So he told me. And I tried it, and son of a bitch, if it is just like the perfect chamber, yeah, and that's nice. and it was like holy crap. So I mean, I myself, I'm always trying something different. Case in point. So I have this machining center, sub spindle, and all, <laughs> and um, we're sitting around the other day. I was chambering barrels, and uh, I was showing my machinist, like, "Hey, get over here. Just watch me chamber a barrel, just in case I ever need you to indicate one or whatever. You can at least get that going for me." So long story short, they watch that. We're sitting around eating lunch and and they says, Well, why don't you why don't we do it on the big machine? I said, Oh man, the setup it's it just takes way too long. I said, Well that would be cool if we did it. I said, Yeah, it would be cool. Well, you know how shit starts, right? So long story short, I got a barrel in there with a true bore. I had I bought a true bore <laughs> just so I could put it put it in that machine. We made a back plate so that we could uh, hold the true bore with the because I have uh, call it chucks, so I'm like, well, I don't want to have to remove the chuck. So we made a back plate that that has a three inch uh, stub out the back. So we just take the true bore and clamp it onto the onto the call it, right? And uh, and then we made a reamer holder. And I just want to know what it, I want to see what it's like to spin the reamer one way and the the barrel the other way and ream mm -hmm. it that way. So. We're about to find out. I'm going to actually, after this interview's over, I'm going to go run it. But it's been a lot of freaking work setting it up. It, you know, I don't know that I'd do it that way, but it's been fun to test play different things, style. play with stuff. The guys are having fun, you know, the machinists, because it's, you know, you know, you know what a machine shop, CNC machine shop can be, where it's, once you get the machines running, it's just, just keep them fed. You know, it can, sure. it can get a little boring, but we've had a lot of fun on this little project. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting you say that, like Speedy's got this way that he's doing things. You know, we've probably changed the way we do work holding 15 times since I've been in business because there's always something better being built or, you know, if you have the time, you could build all this stuff. Like we built back adjustable back plates ourselves in the shop, but now there's two or three companies that make precision adjustable back plates. And we do exactly what you were just talking about. Uh, on the CNCs, just because we won't have to hold them rigid, we actually use hardened collets to hold the barrels, but we have an adjustable back plate that you can true the, the collet to zero. So, um, like what you just said, you're doing is similar to how we've kind of figured out to do some stuff too. But um, we've done it every way, you know, from six jaws to four jaws to adjustable three jaws to collets to, you know, holding them with brass fittings, brass rod you know it's all been done and it all works it's just whatever works best for you and time wise and and for your company and the, the the result just needs to be a dead nuts true chamber of the bore and if that if you accomplish that in any of those ways you're gonna have a gun that shoots so yeah i uh what i started doing with the cncs i'm like you know because we have inch 250 call it so i just take the barrel over there stick it in there and mm -hmm. i i made a i just wrote a program to uh cut off that one inch and face the crown and right. and 
turn and and thread for my tuner, right? And then I'd flip the barrel, and on the backside, I would just rough the tenon, gotcha. right? And then I go put an, an indicator, and then all I had to do is just make light cut you know one light cut right. and on the crown i just face it you know and i was done but that's kind of where it started like what if we did it here what you know and it, it's it's been fun but yeah like you said i've tried the true bore i've tried uh six jaws adjustable i've tried four jaw just the conventional four jaw i've tried spiders in the back i've tr- uh, just and it's uh like you said you kind of end up at the exact same place every time yeah right it just it turn it, it, it in the end it turns out to which way you can do it the the, the easiest to get to the, the final result is what you end up with and different guys do it different ways but it's it's all if you're doing it right it's all the same thing it's just it's funny over the last few years I mean when I first started doing this there was only a couple ways to do it because that was what was made and so uh, we were one of the first people that made a really cool adjustable backing plate for a collet and now there's probably five companies you can buy those from specifically for gunsmithing. So like, you know, this, the age of precision gunsmithing has really been since probably the mid nineties to right now, in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's, that's when I've seen the most change in what's available for gunsmiths as far as, as ultra precision chucks, back plates, you know, you talked about spiders, you know, I've got a sp- spider that we run on the front of our machines that, has an 82 thread pitch so you can really like <laughs> adjust it down to the nats fucking ass on everything so yeah i made yeah. a i made a spider the very first spider that i made um uh, somebody gave me a print and i made it and it's, it had half 13 bolts on there yeah and i made it and as i was indicating <laughs> barrels i'm like oh, this sucks like this yeah. truly sucks like it, it's too coarse so i had to make it again and i think i put half 28s i think they make half 28s um yeah. uh, and uh yeah it was much easier but holy Can you shit 80 eight, <laughs> oh <laughs> man yeah that that's crazy but the that's that's what it get, takes yeah no it's it's like doing this ultra I mean, there's a lot of things that we do in gunsmithing that like isn't done and elsewhere, and like you have to make special stuff for it. And like I said, there are companies now that that I don't know if they make any money at it because I can't believe that there's that many customers for it. But there's a lot of companies that make stuff for precision gunsmithing that never existed before. So look at companies like Gary 419 and, and SAC. They used to build a lot of guns. I don't think they build a ton of guns anymore, but they specialize in making you know, tool and die stuff for, for gunsmithing and for, for precision reloading like that, that didn't exist in the past. I mean, no. I, uh, fact, all these guys making dies with Bob green made all the custom dies that I know of in the country. And, you know, now it's Widden sack and, and area 419 just announced their new fancy dies this week. So I, uh, it's, it's funny that when I saw their die, cause I, uh, I have a die very similar, but mine is actually, yeah, and I've been using it for for a long time, and I actually showed it to Speedy, and Speedy's running it now, but uh, my plan was to release it for a shot show, right, and when I saw that, I'm like, oh, it's okay, (laughs) I mean, it's okay, I mean, you know, people, uh, I actually called uh, uh, Mark Gordon from, Mm -hmm. Uh, from uh, Zach a long time ago and I told him about this micro adjustable headspace right. and he's like you know it just didn't fit with his his st- stuff you know right. and uh, a lot of people don't really quite understand the need for it but for me you know we I don't know it's it's we're trying to get this perfect fit every time but anyway so I've been using a micro adjustable headspace gate uh, die in uh you know, like say Area Four One Nine release one, but I'm I'm still gonna release mine. It's it's not something that I want to do too much of, honestly. Dice because you know I just know what it's gonna be next. Like, can you make me this custom one? And 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 you know you know just because you have CNC machines, custom is, is still custom. Right. Sure. No, I agree. I don't know if you saw they were, Amp released a an automated well semi automated press this week as well that like literally on a graph on your computer gives you the seating pressure. Oh yeah. I've had that one for a while. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> oh yeah. Nice. It's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've had, 
had you know dial indicators on my on my presses for a long time to show that stuff but now that it shows on a computer that's crazy well the beauty about uh that amp press is that uh it it has a motor right it's not a human input because you know you can you can vary the 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 sure. readings with how hard you press but having that constant consistent motor that just applies the same pressure every time and grabs sure. it that has been really helpful has it especially once you start to understand the graph so i had a i had a and i didn't know this until i i i got this press i was having issues with my uh one of my rifles competition rifles it shot unbelievable with once or twice fired brass and then it at some point it get to the point where you could literally pull the bullets out just no neck tension and you know we're kneeling we're doing everything and we just could not figure out what the heck was going on so we get this amp press and you know you can save the graphs everything so we turn the brass load it And I mean, the graph was real steep because it had a lot of pressure. We'd fire it, resize it, and you know, the, the graph looked better. And then we tried different mandrels, just all this configuration to make it work perfect. And now the graph is nice and smooth and they're all the same and everything looks good. We take it and it shot just lights out. I'm like, this is it. Then load it again, all of a sudden the graph, the, the, the graph is not as steep, it's lower, so it's lower pressure. And so we're changing the uh, annealing settings, right? Well, maybe we're not annealing enough. Something's going on. And the next one, it's even lower. And then it gets to the point where we couldn't even, we couldn't even, uh, you know, the bullets, you could see, pull them out by hand. Driving us completely crazy. Until one day, I, I go, it almost seems as if the necks are getting thinner. Like that's the only way you could lose neck tension when everything else is the same. So I went and I pulled the die out of my, it was a die that I made a long time ago that had, uh, it's, it doesn't have a bushing. It's everything's all made together, neck and shoulder and everything. Um, and I go in there, clean out the die and I go in there with a bore scope. The neck had score lines. So every time we sized the breast, it was actually thinning it down, thinning it down. Sure. So, but because of that press, we started tracking it and we've, you know, finally figured out some, you know, it's almost as if the necks are getting thinner and they were. And I mean, uh, it's some of that stuff that you guys go through. I never go through. because I've one of them guys that have yet to use a piece of brass more than three or four times and then pitch it. I don't trust it. I mean, I, I kneel it after a couple of firings and use it, you know, a couple of times, you know, maybe three matches and I throw it away and just start with new stuff again. I've always been that way. I don't, Don't know why. I just never got into saving brass for 20 firings. It's just not my thing. Well, well the, the problem is we, we put so much work into the brass that I know. you don't want to get rid guys, of it. Yeah, you guys are turning and doing all this other crazy stuff. Us PRS guys, it's not so much. I, I actually <laughs> like shooting PRS a lot for that reason. It's it's a lot more relaxing. It's a lot more about just shooting than, than, than everything else. You know, it's like in F-Class, it's like, You win matches in the reloading room, yeah. whereas at PRS you win matches by being out there and practicing sure. and shooting. You know, it's it's a it's a whole different thing, uh, but it's just our target's so damn small. I mean, it's it's one MOA. Most shooters would say, "Well, one MOA is big." Hell, no, it's not. Not when it's a thousand yards away, and you got to put 20 shots inside of that one MOA target. Right. What what year did you start shooting F class real competitively? Do you remember? Uh, I started, I think, oh seven. Okay. And. Uh, I started playing around. I was shooting silhouette and I was shooting uh, a little bit of F class. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then it got real serious and sure. still, still going. And I'll have to go back and look in my office and see when I was, I was actually really serious F class shooter back in the day as well. I think it may have been just before you really got into it. Um, I'm sure still some of the same guys are around because some of those guys probably never leave the sport, but for me, it just got to be, you know, too busy for it um uh but i shot really well hell i had i set a couple records in sacramento back in the day i'm sure they've been beat by now but um, were you guys shooting on the big target the two one way uh we were the shooting no we were sh shooting that M mr target at 600 and whatever the 
uh, it was a five inch X ring at a thousand. Well, now now they changed it. Now that's a ten ring. They cut it oh, in half. Really? Yeah. So oh, really nice. Yeah. So they cut it in half because everybody started shooting clean, right. like all the time. So they. So said, what, what year? What year did they change it? I can tell you for sure. I never. Shot I'm not. It. I'm not sure. I just know that uh, if your X ring was one MOA, then it's been. Because now well, they the call X, it the X ring was a half, the ten okay. ring was one. Okay, it's still the same then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's the only target I've ever shot. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, now the records are crazy. Like six hundred yeah. yards, I think the record is a two hundred with twenty something X's. Like they shot all X's and they just kept going. Right. Uh, yeah, the six hundred the six hundred yard target. If it's a good wind day, guys will break out their VRs and dashers and tear the target up. But in Sacramento barely almost never gets those wins, and I shot. Mainly in Lodi and Sacramento when I was doing it. I never made it out to North Carolina in those matches out there, but um, I enjoyed it. It, it just – I guess at the time it was a bunch of old guys yelling at each other quite a bit, and that's kind of what fucking got, turned it off for me for the most part. But, I mean, I would get – I remember – you probably know Shiraz. I remember I was scoring for Shiraz, and he's, every shot he'd turn around and yell at me for not yelling at him loud enough. Like, so – I was like, man, I don't know if I can handle this shit. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. Me and Tom Manners did it for a number of years. And, um, I went on to PRS and in a pretty much steadfast PRS guy ever since. But I do get out and shoot some ELR, which is very similar in, in the loading aspect of it. Just bigger cartridges and a lot bigger guns. Yeah, a lot. a lot. Um, yeah, Shiraz is still shooting. <laughs> um, he, uh, he's, he's, he's mellowed out quite a bit since then. <laughs> Has he? I bet. I don't have anything against Shiraz. I just remember he was the first guy. I was like yelling at me on the line. I'm like, man, I, I, I don't know what, what I got myself into here. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I remember that actually, as a matter of fact, when I started, I, I, you know, I was doing some of that. It was just so, I just don't think we knew how to behave in a sense of, right. um, you know, the shooter versus the target, you know, you know, it was like, Oh, the reason I'm sucking is because my scorekeeper's not telling me my score or whatever, you know, right. uh, nowadays it's a lot, you know, plus, I mean, the sport has grown to the point that everybody kind of knows how to play F class. I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying play F class. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it is, it is a little bit. I mean, yeah, it is. And, uh, but you know, everybody kind of knows how it's done and kind of everybody knows the etiquette and, kind of things you're supposed to do supposed to say and how you know how it all works but uh yeah it was uh at one point i remember that it's like you're supposed to i got kind of tired of being frustrated so i i got what i would do is i'd show up to the line in the morning and find out who i was shooting with and mm -hmm. we kind of have a little meeting and i'd be like okay guys this is kind of what i like and i like fast pit service and you're going to get the best pit service you've ever had. I'm going to just, right. I'm going to fucking knock it out of the park for you. And, yeah. I, you know, I don't expect you to go as fast as I do, but, you know, I would appreciate it if you did what you could. And, you sure. know, no, I, and I found that that was the best approach ever because. No, you're, you're definitely right for sure. Yeah. And I, I would tell him, I said, look, uh, I had a, I had a young kid one time and I was, that was back when I was still a little you know, easy to frustrate. <laughs> and I couldn't hear him. He, I kept saying, did you get that? Cause you know, you're, you're kind of trying to run X's and then you want right. to make sure that they got them. Otherwise you're, you you know, you're shooting for nothing cause they're not scoring right. it. And I kept saying, did you get that? And I had to stop and turn. Did you get that? And he said, yes. And then I'd shoot again and I wouldn't hear him turn again. And, you know, it gets frustrating. So finally I, I, you know, I shot like shit. And of course, it was his fault, right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, after the fact, I said, "All right, man, what, what's going on here?" And he says, "Well, you know, this is this is kind of like my first or second match, and I, I don't want to be too loud because I don't want to disrupt the other guys." I said, "No, no, no. Here's how it works. There's three of us here: you, me, and the puller. Nobody else is here. We all work for each other, and that's it. You know." And I, I agree with you. Once, he, ex once, once I explained that he, he was, he was, he, he got it and he's like, got it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'll probably get out and shoot one of those matches one of these days. My old seven, 300 WSM still sits in the corner and collecting dust. So 
the three hundreds are making a comeback, or I don't know about a comeback, but they're they're really doing it well these days. The three hundred. I always shot it. I always WSM. shot a, I always shot a three hundred WSM neck to seven. That was just my the case I like. Um, don't know why. I actually tried doing it with just a straight seven WSM, and that case it's got too short a neck and too much powder. This the, the three hundred WSM neck to seven. The seven psalm wasn't out. Or that's probably what I would have went with. Well, the, the new kit on the block for us nowadays is the uh, 6.5 PRC necked up to 7 millimeter. Yeah. It's just the got seven, enough. Uh, the 6.5 SPRC is the, what they call it, I think, or something, or 7 SPRC. Yeah, they so all have PRC. a different name for it. Uh, well, we, we were calling it the PRC because we've been playing around with that round for like three years. Yeah. Uh, but now Hornady released the PRC. Yeah. So now we can't call it that. So, like, yeah. I'm calling mine the PRCW. The W stands for Wheeler because Alex Wheeler is the one that kind of designed it for, for us, you know. Right. So we call it that. But, you know, it's some guy, <laughs> I I posted that on Facebook or one of those platforms about a week ago. And some guy was pissed off because he said I should be calling it the 28 PRC. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, whatever. to avoid confusion. I said, this is even more confusing. Nobody fucking calls it 28. Like, anyway. That case has had every bullet stuck in it for a number of years now because when the 6.5 PRC came out, there was no brass available to build it. Like, that was back during the Newtown, Connecticut shooting thing, mm -hmm. you know, when brass went away. And when that round was being designed, it was originally going to be designed on that 300 RCM case and you couldn't get any cases and Hornady couldn't, you know, couldn't be part of it because it was all their manufacturing was going to 223 nine millimeter when it, what the masses wanted at the time. And so that's where the six, five Psalm came from. That's, you know, that was me looking for a case to kick everyone's ass in PRS. You know, they, they had, they, that was the year they published the speed limit and, you know, a top end for, for bullet weight. And I started looking at the ballistics of everything that was available to mankind. And the 6.5 PRC was like what was going to be that round. And we just couldn't work with Hornady on it because there wasn't enough time for them to mess with it. So I found 80,000 cases at the Remington plant in Arkansas and bought every one of them. Hmm. And we, shit, we probably built a couple thousand guns in that caliber at least. But Jason never forgot it. He came back four years later and said he's still interested in making a 6.5 on this RCM case. And me, Joe Thielen, and Jaden Quinlan put our heads together, and that's where that round came from. And it, it had been a 7 and a three three eight and all kinds of stuff already in their lab. I mean, that's something that they played with hugely back in the day. But I think the reason they went uh, – I, I don't actually know this for, for certain. They went with the longer case in the 7 – is because the whole idea is to make hold chambers better and you can wipe out a seven rim mag chamber with that reamer and, and make it better. And same thing with the 300 PRC. You can take a 300 wind mag and run that 300 PRC reamer in there and make it a better cartridge, you know, better design, you know, get rid of the stupid belt, all that stuff. But you're right. That little six, five neck to seven is a hell of a little cartridge. It's it's awesome. It's uh, so far it's pretty good. And now the Lapua's making brass. Uh, you know, all the a lot of the F class shooters are flocking to it just because yeah. you know good brass. And now the Lapua announced that they're not going to be making two eighty four and six five two eighty four for a while. Right. Uh, so I think a lot of most are flocking to the to that six five PRC necked up to seven. And yeah, of course, was surprising. That was really surprising to see the two eighty four and the and the. Six five by forty seven on that list. I some of the other ones I can understand, but those two with the amount of target shooters involved, I'm really surprised that that those two were on there. That floored me, to be honest. Yeah, um, you know, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> well, Alpha's already making six five by forty seven. I guess I'll have to step it up a little bit for those guys. <laughs> that's 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 going to be quite interesting. Uh, you shoot a six five by forty seven Lapua with Alpha brass. Yeah. Well. It is hey, what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, so let's let's talk about the GT. Okay. Where does that come from, uh, Eric? Eric was telling me that he that's his kind of his his new uh, his new toy, the GT. He's he's having a lot of fun with that. So, uh, and I know you you were uh, were you 
You work. Who did you work with on that case? Tom Jacobs, bench six hundred yard bench rest Hall of Fame guy. Is Tom's a good friend of mine. He makes bullets, vapor trail bullets. He has a, a bench rest range about an hour and a half north of here. We shoot a lot of PRS together. He's he's more of a bench rest shooter that dabbles in in PRS, and I'm more of a PRS shooter that dabbles in other disciplines. So we hang out together. You know, we hunt together. Just all around good friends and when the dasher started to become actually the br first but when the br and dasher started to become popular in prs the problem was making it feed good in magazines and, you know you can make a gun shoot you know one little hole that's what those cartridges are designed to do but making it feed properly and not cause you issues and on stages and matches was a big problem so in my mind as a gunsmith do i want to build a gun and knowing that the guy's going to have some feeding issues and it's a little bit better now for those cartridges because there's a number of companies, like I was telling you earlier that like almost prey upon problems in the industry to fix them. And now there's mag kits and magazines and stuff designed specifically to feed those in a, in a repeater. So it's gotten better for them, but it's still really too short of a, a cartridge for a standard length action. So the GT was like, look, what can we do? To come up with a case that will do what those two cases do on the accuracy side and still give the, the length for feeding. So it was a bunch of trial by error. There wasn't a case really to make it out of easily. So this the case we we're just talking about, the 6.5 by 47 Lapua, super well-built case. It's got, you know, really thick head on it. It's, you know, built for pressure. Uh, we use those, sh you know, shorten them. Um, Necked them. We, we decided to use a 35 degree shoulder, kind of try to get the best of both the worlds. You know, 40s bump up quite a bit when they feed, so they can cause feeding issues themselves. 30, you know, is the new norm, I guess, in cartridge shoulders. Like that's way more prevalent than, than the old 20. So we decided to kind of cut it in between and put a 35 on it, like the 284 case, and add a little neck, which has always been the problem with the dasher. You almost end up with no neck. So we got hundred thousands longer body, fifty thousands longer neck. Change it to a thirty-five degree shoulder. Made that stuff by hand from six five by forty-seven. I think we made five hundred pieces at his house one weekend. Yeah, took all weekend, <laughs> and uh, we shot it pretty clandestine for an entire year. We didn't let anyone look at what we were shooting. We picked up all our brass and kind of kept it hidden. Made sure it worked the way we we wanted it to. Um, you know, I was talking to Hornady the whole time, telling them, hey, if this works, can you get behind it? And of course, Jason's answer is always the same. By 200,000, like, I'll make whatever the hell you want. And uh, so it worked out really well. I mean, no feeding issues whatsoever, really tight groups, super, super, super tight SDs. You know, it uses the same type of powders you'd use in a dasher, uh, Varget being the, the main one. Um, then, by the way, the new 15.5 that from uh, the reloader series is almost purpose built for it. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it sits dead nuts in the burn rate between 43 and 50 and Varget. And because that case has just a little bit more capacity than the Dasher, it's almost absolutely perfect for it. But uh, yeah, it does what everyone wanted it to do. And the guys that were having a lot of problems feeding Dashers that tried them, like it's almost natural for them to go to the GT. And yeah. Now you said you used the six five forty seven case. Correct. So when I started shooting PRS, I started with a six five by forty seven Lapua because that's what I had for F class. You know, that's how I started F class, and I thought, well, this is a no brainer. But yeah. then you know, I noticed the uh, everybody shooting sixes, right? And mm -hmm. so anyway, so for me it was a no brainer. Well, just neck it down to six millimeter, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, I was telling, I was being told how. It's real finicky, and it's yeah. And then and I, uh, same exact thing. Well, th they like kept every saying customer that customer I've ever built one of those for claimed it was really finicky to load for. And once you found a load for it, it shot, but it would take you t ten times longer than normal to to work a load up for it. Well, so everybody told me not to do that. So what I did is I called, and it it just made zero. It had it made no sense to me why it wouldn't shoot right because I'm like, well, the XC shoots, the yeah. Dasher shoots. The six Creed shoots, you know, that one's kind of in between all those. Why wouldn't it shoot? Yeah. So I called JGS and I said, hey, send me a reamer print for a six by 47, right? Mm -hmm. So they sent me the reamer print. Well, then I realized 
You figure it out? Somebody, well, I don't know that I figured it out, but I realized, because the 6.5 by 47 shoots, right? Yeah, sure does. And I realized somebody, whoever made the 6x47, they actually changed the body dimensions. Not mm -hmm. just the neck. They also changed huh. the body. At least the at least the print that JGS sent me. So and with anything like that, there's probably a million prints because how do prints normally get made? Somebody yeah. makes a dummy cartridge and sends it to Kia for JGS and says, base your print off of this and give me ten thousandths clearance of the bullet. I mean, that's right. So so they send me a print and I said, uh, I said, uh, okay, here's what I want. I said, just keep the body exactly the same as a 6.5 by 47 Lapua. Don't change it. Leave, leave that alone and just neck it down. And I took a loaded round and I measured it. And I increased five thousandths. I said, give me five thousandths clearance. I think it was five and a half thousandths. Five thousandths clearance. And I like long free bores. So I said, mm -hmm. uh, just give me 150 thousandths free bore. Okay. Send it. And they made me a reamer. I have yet to chamber a barrel that doesn't shoot with that reamer. It's okay. just uh, the the reamer. That's another thing that I I ordered at two seventy five neck diameter. The reamer that they had that was a no turn was a two seventy two. It only had like two thousands or two and a half clearance. Huh. And anyway, and uh, and of course I didn't want to go with the dasters or the six brs or any of that for for feeding issues. Right. So I just. I've been shooting the 647 Lapua, and I've never had any issues with it. I load uh, Vitavori N150, which is a slightly slower than Varget and slightly faster than 4350. Works perfect. But, yeah, that was even Alex Wheeler. I called him up, and he's like, I said, yeah, I'm going to do a 647. Don't do that. It's not going to shoot. And I'm just <laughs> I'm just stubborn as hell. And I said, well, I'm going to find out. You know, that's the beauty about having my own lathe and all that i said if it right. doesn't work then i'll cut it off and start over you know it's it's strange that you say that because i personally other than shooting some guns that we built in the shop have never played with the six by 47 myself i never like spun a barrel for myself and and started messing with it um i would have done it similar to what you did i would have just started with my own piece of brass and worked it the way i wanted to and then send it off and have it mic'd and give them some clearances and have my own reamer made i don't normally just buy reamers off the shelf that i don't know who designed just for the exact very reason you just explained you never know what somebody did but um i never did it but i know wade studeville played with it forever the whole team of oklahoma guys played with it forever and Every single one of them said, yeah, you'd get it to shoot, but it never stayed in tune and just bought it all the time. And they all gave up on it. it I mean, most of them went back to either shooting straight six creed more or they got sucked into the dasher thing. I mean, they yeah, even a couple of them just went straight back to shooting the six five by 47 because it never really did them wrong anyway. But um yeah, I don't know about that one. Maybe you, maybe you figured it out by the clearances or something, or maybe you just got lucky in a few barrels. I have no idea. But well, I've, I've, the I had census a... across the board has been it's always been finicky, and I never. I'm like you. I don't know why it, it shouldn't be. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, a friend of mine came by, and uh, he's like, "I want to, I want a six. Uh, what do you want? A BRX?" And I said, "Okay." And he goes, "Or well, whatever you think." I said, "Okay." I said. Uh, I said, 6, 647 it is. He goes, well, I heard it's finicky. I said, well, we're going to find out. I said, it works great for me. I'm going to chamber you one. And he's, he's to this day, he said, that's the most accurate barrel he's ever had. And again, I've chambered, I don't do many because I don't, uh, I've probably done eight or ten different ones with the same reamer. And I'll they've make, all I'll just. Make you I'll make you a deal. The next time I have someone order one, I'm going to call you for your reamer. Call print. me up. No, no, we should do that. Call me up. I will send you my reamer because you know it's real. And this is kind of the reason I did this podcast because you know I wanted to get outside of F class and out, outside of what I know and experiment. Right, sure. But yeah, next time somebody wants a six forty seven, call me up. I will send you my reamer. You guys chamber okay. barrel and then just report back because you know I'm sitting here thinking. It works. I mean, it's worked for me, but as you know, I mean, that's the difference also because you do so many, right? And, you know, my sample might be small enough that, you know, it just, it just, you know, it, it's not. Certainly, certainly don't do a lot of six by 47s. We have a reamer and 
I would say it's been hit or miss. I've, I've never had any like guns that just shot like complete crap with it, but like guys would say the same thing, even with the reamer we use that it's, it ends up being finicky. And I've had a couple of guys say that it was a laser for them. So it just depends, but some people's version of what a laser is are different than others too. So, well, now Hornady just released Jaden. Uh, I'm trying to have him on the podcast to discuss the small sample. You know, I don't know if you saw that podcast they had where, you know, they say, you know, you need 20 to 30 shot groups to really know if the gun yeah. shoots. Yeah. You know, so I'd somewhat, somewhat agree with that, but you're testing the, both the ammunition and the gun at the same time. I mean, and the shooter. perfectly, perfectly loaded ammo with perfectly, with perfect bullets, perfect base to OJ, perfect diameter. And then like you said, the perfect shooter at the same time to do a true test. That's what makes really all this stuff so interesting is there's always that little bit of unknown mixed into everything we do. And it's, it's trying to figure out the unknown constantly that drives all of us. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have, uh, you know, I mean, me doing F class and, and traveling that that's, that's the key component right there. Traveling because like, I just went to England in September and this, I took this gun that was just, just so good. And once I get there, it's not <laughs> yeah. and i'm like oh crap but you know i have a tuner so i spent we went two days early they had a different match going on so we started shooting that match and you know i used my tuner and shrunk it back in and and i was it was happy the rest of the rest of the way but uh you know he, i don't know it, it, it i think i think also the quality of the rifle matters right because if you have for example one of your rifles five shot group this measures quarter moa right it's to me it has a very high likelihood that it's going to be a very good maybe half moa gun or or less you know it's because i think if i remember correctly they were saying if it's quarter moa it has the tendency to be somewhere around three quarter moa down to you know 0.1 or something like that and i'm like uh, it has to do with the rifle as well you know because a bad rifle can possibly shoot a small group but it's and again I, that's why i want to have them on so we can discuss this more in depth because right. there's so many things that i don't understand uh they were also saying well you know 10 shot groups 10 10 shot groups is not the same as one 100 shot group well absolutely it's not the same but what about the barrel like right what well, about what, fouling what also again this is all one two or a group consensus opinion on on what substantiates how the gun shoots so if you go pound 20 rounds to a gun into a group you got a lot of stuff changing so that barrel's getting hot you know the chamber area is getting hot but the, the muzzle area is getting really hot um and that wasn't like that when you first started so well, then you have true, you have mirage through the your, scope you know, off of that barrel yeah, hundred percent. Like that's there's a bunch of things you could sit there and think about what's changing while you're shooting twenty shots. Is that truly testing the accuracy of the gun? Well, it might be if you're shooting a discipline that requires you to shoot twenty, like high power or something. You F know, class. Yeah, F class. But uh, for you know bench rest guys, they're shooting five. Like, so is that a true test for those guys? No, because they're not going to shoot twenty. So. You know, I've I've done a lot of testing in my shop, and if you read past posts I've made, I mean, we a lot of guys will will argue with me about it. But what's most guys do at the range? They shoot three shot groups. Well, when I test a gun, I normally shoot three or four of those, and you know, measure the average of four or three shot groups. And I only do that because that's what most of the customers go to the range do, and I want to be able to mimic what my customers are doing. Now, if a customer says, I want you to go shoot a five shot group and send it with a gun, that's what I do. I mean, I'll do whatever they say, but uh, my normal test for accuracy is shoot three or four three shot groups and measure the average because I know that there's not really a lot of change going on with the gun at that point. The gun's staying relatively, you know, cool. You know, I'm not getting any mirage off of it. The wind conditions probably didn't change as much during three shots as it did 20. Um, that 20 and 10 shot group that Jaden's talking about. Yeah. That's a great test. If you're in indoors and can keep the gun completely cool and in the same place on the shoulder of a guy shooting it. And then the shooters, a known like perfect shooter, like 
you know. Or even um, a rail gun or some some kind of device that that eliminates a shooter. Yeah, but I've never even seen any of those test platforms. Like, so Marine Corps has got a badass test platform that they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to perfect. And I've been there several times when a when a known shooter could outshoot that thing. Like they take the same gun as a machine and the known shooter would shoot better than the damn machine did. So, so, so I got a rail gun and I told Speedy about it. I said, yeah, I got a rail gun. I said, it'll be really cool. I'm going to go, you know, on my channel, I'm going to, I'm going to do all these tests of things that we know to be a fact and I'm going to test them, but now we're going to test them in a rail gun. I said, that's just going to eliminate the human aspect of it. Because again, every time I shoot a group or whatever, and I post it online, they go, well, yeah, but you know, you may have done this, you may have done that, or maybe, you know, if, it, if it's got a flyer, there, there goes the word flyer, um, they'll go, well, you pull that shot. I'm like, well, how do you know it was me? Well, it had to be you, right? I said, well, if I eliminate me, then there's no discussion anymore. It is what it is. Right. And Speedy goes, you don't just shoot a rail gun. Like, they don't all shoot. You have to learn how to shoot a rail gun. I'm like, what do you mean? It's it's a machine. It just sits there. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. So he goes, no, no, you, you have to know how to set it up, how to shoot it. It's it, You don't just shoot a rail gun. It, it doesn't always automatically just perfect. I'm like, God dang it. It's just every every time I try to eliminate, and, and you know, and that's the, the thing about side. precision, right? It's... You were talking about that earlier. It's it's all these small things that stack. Yeah. And if one of those is not right, the whole thing can just go to hell, you know? Yeah. So, again, I mean, it's just, there's so many. It's always that mystery, though. Like, there's every one of us always have a mystery question in your head. Like, what what's causing that? Or what, like, you were talking about that barrel that Speedy finally figured out and got it to you know, where the 50 millions indicator wasn't moving. I've had barrels like that on an action that was perfect. Shoot like shit, like no explanation, like check everything. And every single solitary thing was as perfect as it got. And it still shot like shit. So put another barrel on it, shoots perfectly, send that barrel out. And I'm sitting here with this barrel in my hand thinking, what the hell? Like this, everything about this thing's perfect and it drives me crazy. And I'll check that sucker for hours trying to figure out what, like end to end with a borescope, sending it off to Frank Green and have him check the size all the way through. Nothing's wrong with it. It's perfect. Stick it on another action, bet it in another stock, goes back to shooting one hole. But for some reason on that one gun, and that one action, it wouldn't shoot. Stuff like that, I'll never know. And I don't know that anyone could ever figure it out. And guns do stuff like that. And it's... it's Har harmonics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe a tuner from you on that gun would have made it shoot one little fucking hole. I mean... That, that's uh, that's another thing that I was telling uh, Jim Borton, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm... I always say I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I have their phone numbers, <laughs> just like yeah. I have yours. Um, and I... So when I got the rail gun... Speedy told me about it. Well, then I called Jim Borden, you know, and I ordered an action because I wanted to put an action in that rail gun. And I told Jim the same thing. And Jim goes, same freaking thing. He goes, well, rail guns, they don't just shoot. I said, okay, Speedy told me. And he goes, well, what is your purpose? I said, well, I want to do some testing. I said, and since I have it, I'm going to throw, because I had a special plate made to where I, it holds the action. Because typically they hold the barrel. And this one holds the action. I said, so I can put on barrels and take them off and put them back on my F-class rifles. That way I can use the rail gun to test my barrels. Right. And and Jim goes, well, just because it shoots in the rail gun doesn't mean it's going to shoot in your in your F-class rifle because everything's different. The harmonics and yeah. so like son of a bitch. Nothing yeah. is just simple. It goes back to what we were saying earlier, like the, the three B's like do everything right do everything to the best of your ability and then it comes down to to tuning your loads on the bench or tuning your tuner on the end of your barrel like i i personally i'd, I'd love to actually maybe change the subject slightly to, to learn a little bit more about tuners since you're sitting here talking to me right now but i've used tuners on rimfire for a long time and i know they do work very well but i always wondered on center fire do they stay in tune or is it something you tune before every match? Do you, do you work with the load as well? Or do you shoot a known load and then just use the tuner to, to dial it in? I mean, those are all the things in my mind that 
you know, and a lot of people ask me these questions too, and I don't have the answer. So I figured I'd use this, this so, couple seconds. To, so to tuners an are like anything else. Um, they are, you know, just like the barrel, you know, metal, you know, gets cold. It, it behaves different than when it's hot. Right. Yeah. Uh, stock, the bedding, everything, all of the above changes. Right. So they have a different tune as temperature changes. The tune will change, which is yeah. precisely why it's, it's good to have a tuner when, uh, uh, but what I do is I test, for example, it's been cold. I told you it's going to be in the, in the, you know, t we're going to be in 20 degrees in about a few days. I will get out there <laughs> with my load. Yeah. I don't change anything. And I will go and I have a thousand yard range and I will go and I tune my barrel and I would write that down, you know, it's like, so that way, if I ever encounter anything like that, but typically Typically, let's say you tune at 70 degrees and you have this tune and then you go and you're shooting at 90 degrees and your gun's out of tune, you move that tuner towards the shooter okay. and you're going to find your tune. As the temperature goes up, you move it towards the shooter. Okay. Uh, and that's why my, my newest tuner, the, the V2 version, they now they go towards the shooter. As the numbers go up, it goes gotcha. towards the shooter because, uh, so, you know, and that, that I haven't really released that information yet, <laughs> but, right. uh, since you asked and, 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 and that's the thing that most people don't know. They're like, which way do I go? Well, temperature, you know, your baseline is where you tuned it at. All right. So now as far as do I change the load? No, change one thing at a time. Once I have a load, the load stays. Especially because we preload, like my world championship ammo, we shipped it three months ago to South Africa. I'm not right. going to see that ammo until March next year. So right. can't change that. So when I get there, depending on the temperature and all that good stuff, right, I'm going to, I'm going to have a pretty much a database already of where I need. And, and I don't sit there in tune. I verify, for example, okay. it's like, okay, this is uh I don't know. Let's say I tune my barrel here at 80 degrees, and when I get there, it's 50. Well, I'm gonna go away from the, you know, away from the shooter, and uh, I'll have a pretty good idea where I need to be. So I'll test. The very first thing I do is I move nothing, and I shoot. See how it when does. You, and when you say towards or away from the shooter, you're talking about the in and out. In and out. So yeah. yeah. You thread it in or out, right? But uh, so. You know, the first thing I'm going to do when I get there is do nothing and just shoot it. See how it does, right? And then I'm like, well, I'm colder here than I was back home. I'm going to move it away. And I'll have a setting that's going to be pretty close. And I'll shoot. And this is back to, you know, I'll shoot a full match, 15, 20 shots. And just keep an eye on typically. And this is why I like doing this during matches that don't count in a way. Because typically, you know, when you're shooting for score, you're clicking up, clicking down, all that stuff. Well, I don't, if I'm testing the tuner, I just hold center and I don't care if I'm hitting the freaking nine ring, my whole, right. all of my shot. I'm just trying to see how it's trending. Right. And, uh, and I'll test it. And if, it, if it, it's either going to get better or it's going to get worse. Right. Gotcha. If it gets, uh, let's say it gets slightly better, then I'm going to test on each side of that setting that i already had and I, i'll use another match or two to see that and typically it gets better and like when i went to england it was my gun wasn't bad you know we we talk about it, it was shooting tall well back home it was shooting about half a way vertical when i got there it was shooting about eight inches which, which you know it's 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 a big difference yeah so i tuned it in and and but typically that's how that works Temperature okay. changes the tune because it change, it changes how the metal behaves. It changes so everything. You, so you talked earlier about writing stuff down. So essentially, you can keep a dope book for your for your guns. It's, and it's that a tuner. it's a dope book for your tuner. Yeah, that makes sense. I was kind of wondering because I knew that there's no way you could just set you know get a load, set this thing, and up at the range, get it tuned to, to shoot knots. And then it just stays there forever, right? Like I, I couldn't buy that. Now I, I, I kind of get it on rimfire some a little bit more because there's less movement of everything. There's no recoil. They don't heat up as much. And plus, you're stuck. You don't hand load rimfire. You go to 
Lapua and you shoot everything they've got. You go to Ely and shoot everything they got and you find the one load that shoots good in your gun and then you tune it with the tuner and you're pretty much there. Like you can't do anything else. Right. Like the aim, aim you guys will build a gun and buy, I don't remember what the number is, it's some crazy amount. It's like 50,000 rounds of one lot once they find out what shoots in that gun and that's what they, that's the lifespan of that gun. And it typically shoots that ammo for the life of the gun for the most part. Yeah. And, uh, you know, tuner design, uh, I've gotten with speedy, uh, you know, this is one thing that I don't, I don't just sit here and go, I'm the expert at this. You know, I, I, I talk to different people and I say, Hey, try my tuner and tell me what's wrong with it. Don't tell me what's great about it. Tell me what, what's wrong with it. And, you know, I've, I use them myself. I've been, I've been doing tuner for over 10 years now and always experimenting, always trying different things. But uh, Speedy was big proponent of you got to kill the harmonics. You got to kill the harmonics. Well, that's why the new one, and also backlash. You understand backlash. Yeah. A lot of shooters would say, "Well, you know, I I I tested the tuner from zero to I don't know twenty five, and it shot great at ten, but then when I came back to ten, it didn't shoot." And I'm like, "Well, backlash. You you, you got to go past it and come back." And most of the time, they they wouldn't do that, right? And it's just so on the new design, I put a I put a spring on it. That way, if you're going in or out, it doesn't matter. It's it's always pushing against that tuner. Pushing against, yeah. And it's huh. it's very repeatable, and it's also lighter, which uh, force you know the, the 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 window seems wider. Right. It's easier huh. to find. I wonder. Well, that would make it a lot more harder to design and uh, a lot more expensive to build, but you could probably figure out a way to put a ball screw on that thing and there'd be no backlash. <laughs> well, so, you know, I have my own machines here and all. So I thought about that. I'm like, what if I do like, a, what do they call it? Butcher's thread or whatever, like a ball screw would have. And yeah, that is not a problem for me to do it here, but you know, people buy the tuners and now they have somebody else put them on for them. Well, that, you know, yeah, that's where things it. fall apart, you know? Huh. Yeah, I'd, I've never played with a, a tuner much more than just the rifles we've installed them on and taken with the range. And I, there's definitely a change. Like, you can make the group size change. And and uh, so I know that they work. I just never talked to someone long enough that had used them to understand the longevity of it and how much you had to change that tuner. I was just wondering if, like, checking it right before the match is what most guys do so prs what i would do uh i would you know during sighting i would just again just do nothing and shoot a group or two right. or three or whatever and just see how it's doing and then you can check it and see if you can shrink them and typically typically it's not going to change much but now if you're going like like phil Valayo, he's going from wherever he's at, Nebraska or something. He went down right. to Tennessee for the AG Cup. So he calls me like two days before. He goes, what should I do? I'm like, leave the load alone. When you get down there, tune it. And That's, he's like, yeah. Actually, there was like, I don't want to quote me on this, but I think it was six guys out of 43 using tuners. And I, I, didn't, I should have stopped and asked him, you know, what their process was. But uh they're start you're starting to see more guys in PRS use them. They're there for a while. Like they got or I saw them all the time. Like a lot of people are using them. And I've seen those same guys not with them on anymore. So I don't know if they I think a lot of guys haven't figured out exactly what you're supposed to do with them. I think that might be a big problem with them. So I'm a I have a I have a I'm at a pretty bad spot myself because I know how to use them, but I've learned right. from others. Like there's this guy named John Myers, six time national champion. And this guy to me, he had tuners figured out because what he would do is he'd uh, he'd pull out a device. He came from drag racing, right? Okay. So they're always tuning and right. Sure. So this, he had this device that he'd pull out, and I don't know what he was reading. Well, I do know now, but let's just say I didn't at the time. I didn't know what he was doing. Nobody knew what he was doing. He had this box that he dra he dragged to the line. He had his rifles and everything in there, and. He would only open that box to take his rifle out and set up. And he, once he was done shooting, put everything back and close that box. So nobody knew what kind of gear he had. That was his, that was the point, right? But he'd get a device out, get some kind of reading. It was a big box. 
put it back in. He grab a notebook, open it up, and he'd literally go and turn that tuner before he starts shooting. Every string, he turned a tuner, and he was always in tune. I mean, his gun just. So I mean, he won six national cha- national championships. Well, now he retired from shooting, and he showed me his whole process. But it was one of those like, don't tell nobody. Like, okay, yeah, yeah. I won't. But it's uh, so that's uh, uh, all I can tell you is yes, they do change, but. There's a way that it you can pinpoint it like to the T. I think that's I think I think that's the thing that people need to realize that they do change. So, so I think people have put them on their gun and tuned them and say, "Oh yeah, it shoots great." And then all of a sudden it didn't shoot great. And they're like, "Oh, this thing doesn't fucking work." Well, if they knew that the process and that you have to actually, you know, change the tune for different weather or change the tune for you know for the condition or the different ammo, then they would realize, okay, it's a it's a tool like anything else but you have to figure it out, know how to use it. And I think that's where the confusion is with tuners right now, including myself. I mean, I've, before talking to you, I always assumed that you had to do these things, but now I know in my mind, if I, if I use a tuner, I need to check it in different temperatures. I need to check it, you know, before I shoot a PRS match, you know, confirm, you know, what I, what I was shooting before and make sure that it's doing the right and make a change if I need to. I think, Maybe with that knowledge, some people will understand them a little bit better. Because I had a guy just last night call me about this exact question. He's a, a experienced shooter. He's not a PRS shooter. He's not really an anything shooter. He's a major league baseball player, but he loves to shoot. And when he's you know, not pitching, so in this offseason, he's shooting. And he shoots a ton. And he started asking me about tuners. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm going to have to pass the buck on this question. I can tell you this. And my knowledge and experience, they do work but I do not believe they just stay in tune forever. Like you set them to a setting and that's where you leave it. I don't think that's the case. No. And uh, it's funny you say it's a ma- major league baseball player. Cause I just interviewed one last night. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, but uh, we mainly focus on the mental game, just, just kind of okay. how they approach the whole deal. But, but yeah, tuners are it's, so speedy did a, I just posted on my, on my YouTube channel. He had his base, you know, and he had an electronic tuner and he says, watch, and he'd play the, the G string mm-hmm. and it'd go perfect to tune. And all he had to do is turn the bass sideways. Right. And then it'd go out of tune just because the weight of the neck. Right. It's this to this. And it pulls on the sure. strings different and and, and it and it completely go out of tune. And he says, That's how barrels work, you know, in yeah. a similar way but different, right? Because you have it cantilevered out there. And, and yeah, they change, again, when it's cold, when it's hot, when the temperature, you know, the stock, how it interacts with everything. But, uh, yeah, they don't always – and that's the one thing that a lot of people say, well, they're just not consistent. Well, technically, actually, as a matter of fact, they are. <laughs> they're just showing you what the rifle – the rifles are not consistent. How many times right. have you had a, a – a, that's why Betris guys, they change – they sit there and they change the powder – all day long, up or down, depending on the conditions, right? Because the the rifles will never shoot exactly the same, always. This isn't a huge secret, but I bet a lot of people don't know this, but it goes along with what you're saying and in the change. Like when we build AR-15s, our barrel extensions are oversized. They don't fit in the upper receivers. We have to heat up the upper receiver, which changes the size of the neck of that AR-15 until the and it's not melting it or anything like that or making it soft. When you heat up aluminum, it gets bigger and that extension will fit in there. And then when it cools, you're not getting that thing off. Like it's not coming off until you heat it up again because there's about a thou and a half interrupted fit there. Um, you can do the same thing with threads. I don't, I don't ever tell anyone to do it because getting them off is a big challenge, but you can do the same thing with threads. You can heat up a receiver and have threads that are oversized and you'll get it to fit once and it's very hard to get them off at that point. You, you're you going to definitely gall probably getting it off. But that's happening in a bore and in a chamber and in, an, and in a muzzle break and in everything else when we shoot. When that metal gets warm, it grows. It, 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 the bore size changes. And so I, I could see that being another big factor in, in why things, you know, go south sometimes. I mean, we've all seen those barrels that shoot like crap when they heat up. 
you know, that's more stress than it is things getting bigger. It's the stress of the metal moving the barrel as it warms up. But that bore size is definitely growing. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And right. three bores growing, everything's growing when you get it warm. Yeah, everything changes. And, and uh, you know, I, I use heat shrink tooling for my lathe, for my mill. Yep. And so you under you know 100 percent oh yeah, what i'm yeah, talking about 100 percent, and um and you know it's just one of these things that it's it's a and, and the thing about with social media like we discussed at the beginning now people interact with each other that are hell not forget it, other side of the country other side of the world right, right. and they try to compare notes <laughs> and they don't match up well, of course they're not going to match up you know you're in totally different uh atmosphere conditions than than a person you know uh you know even a person in washington state versus florida state right they can't compare notes on on tune or tuner they can to some degree but at some point it's just not going to match up yeah and a lot of that would have to do with how that thing's installed too because you know depending on the, the thread tenon that went into it and whether it was exactly to your print or whether they left it long or short that's going to change the tune as well so I would, oh, I would assume everything matters. <laughs> That's yeah. the problem, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, well, I don't know. It, it's, it's very interesting. It's what keeps it interesting in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I've always wondered, well, I know it can't be done, but it's always funny when you talk to customers because they'll say, I want my throat to be exactly like this. Well, okay. Well, we need to order a ramer. What do you mean? Can't you just cut it that way? No, sir. It doesn't work that way. They haven't ad- they haven't admitted the adjustable reamer yet. And even even <laughs> uh, even reamers have a tolerance, right? And barrels have a tolerance. Do. And, and then when you, you do it, that, and every time you use that reamer, that tolerance changes just a little bit. Well, not only that, right? They go, well, I want a certain re- uh, a certain free bore. Yep. Whatever it may be, right? Let's say one hundred and fifty thousands. And you give them that free, you know, you order a reamer, it's cut to that free bore, and you chamber them a barrel, and they're real happy. And then they ask for another one, right? Well, now yeah. that cham- that second barrel may have had those grooves slightly deeper or shallower, right? Well, that changes the free bore. Yeah. And now they're yeah, going, I asked you to use the same reamer. Like, why? we did. Well, this yeah. one's totally different. Well, yeah. don't worry about it. <laughs> it's, it's not totally different. It's minusculely different, but it's different. 100%. Yep. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's interesting for sure. So you talked about how you test your rifles. What is your uh, your requirements? Like at what point? You- so our guarantee, which I guess is our requirements, is all our um, target competition guns will shoot three-eighths of an inch with match grade over-the-counter ammunition. So we test with federal a lot if we can't get, Hornady, we can test obviously with a lot of Hornady ammo. Some of the other stuff that you can't get in those, we test with Lapu and 6.5x47. You know, if it's a if it comes in a factory match grade ammunition, that's it will shoot three eights. Um, it's normally not too hard to obtain. Hunting guns are a little bit different because I don't know what the person's going to be shooting in it. And a you know, an Acubon shoots different than an ELDX, shoots different than a nozzler partition, you know. Like guys aren't going to get, you know, one whole accuracy out of swift A frames. They're not designed to be accurate. They're designed to break bone and shatter, you know, the humerus of a, of a elephant, you know, they're, they're designed to, to do things. So uh, accuracy on hunting guns really depends on what the, the shooter is putting through his gun, because we, we don't know that. Like it seems like hunting guys, they don't even really know that when they buy the gun, they're going to try everything out of the box until they get whatever shoots the best. But um, I have a limit of what I would expect the gun to shoot. If they call me and say they're shooting, you know, Hornady ELDX and I can't get it to group better than an inch and a half, I want to look at it and, and see what the problem is. 90% of the time there's something installed improperly or the scope's you know, moving in the, in the base, it's, it's, it's something that's easily fixable. It's, it's so rare anymore with the components that we use to have a gun, we have to rebarrel, but it, it I'm not going to lie. It happens, you know, every four or 500 tubes, we get something that's awry with one. And some of it's that stuff, like I was telling you earlier, it's unexplainable. It doesn't shoot on that gun, but 
I don't normally throw those barrels away because they just bother me so much. I want to look and stare and, and mic and mess with them until I can figure it out. Um, but yeah, three eighths is the norm for competition stuff. A lot of them shoot better than that. Um, they don't leave unless they shoot that. And then the hunting guns that I can't really technically guarantee because I don't know what people are shooting in them. You know, I might build a hunting gun and a guy's favorite bullet to shoot is a swift A-frame. Well, those bullets are great for doing what they do, but they're not the most accurate. And I've got a, I don't mind busting on swift A-frame because they weren't ever designed to be accurate. They were designed to do a thing. There's other bullets that supposedly are designed to be accurate that aren't, in my opinion, but I don't really on these type of things, bad mouth companies is not my business, but I well, normally yeah. politely tell somebody if they call me and say, Hey, I'm shooting this bullet and it's not shooting good. Yeah. Why don't you shoot this one instead? <laughs> Give it a try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I get, as you can imagine, I get people hitting me up on email messages, whatever, always asking, Hey, well I have whatever X and it's just not working. Mm, try this, you know, Try well. I heard from a friend. Well, yeah. How's it yeah. working out for you? It's not okay. Then try this, and then yeah. get back with me, and they'll come back with like, "Oh my god!" All of a sudden, this thing just shoots. Yeah, okay. Sure. There you go. Good. And if it yeah. doesn't, well, that you know, there might be something else wrong. But there, now, there's def that's the thing. There's definitely some bullets out there that are just inherently crazy accurate. And I'll give you a, a good example. If if anyone is shooting a six mil and they, they think the gun doesn't shoot. Like there's something wrong with my gun. It's not shooting. Okay. What, what have you done? Well, I just, I put this load in. It doesn't shoot. Okay. Well, I don't know if you tune the load or what your loading experience is, but do me a favor, call up Tom Jacobs and buy a few of his one Oh threes load them 10 thousands off the lands and call me like 95% of the time. God damn those things shoot one hole. Well, that bullet don't know what his secret is that one bullet, but that bullet is crazy inherently accurate. It doesn't matter if you jam it, jump it, whatever. It's just, it just shoots. So like, that's the one bullet I know, especially with six millimeter guys, try this, see if it works. Now they don't have the best BC, you know, they may not be the best bullet for everything, but for, for testing accuracy, if you can't get that bullet to shoot in your gun, I'd say there's something wrong with your gun. I would, I would say that across the board. They shoot that freaking good. Here's something interesting that Speedy told me. He said back in the day there was these one these bullets that, and I don't remember what bullets they were, but he said same thing. They just shot like you want to win, you gotta you gotta shoot those bullets. But what do you do when you sort a bullet or when you measure a bullet? Well, you you sort it before you shoot it. Well, he right. said they would measure all these bullets and you know trying to kind of crack the code and right. there was really nothing special about it huh. so speedy knew this person that worked at a, at a lab and he said hey can you can you see what what's up with these with high speed photography and all that what they found out is these bullets were again they were nothing special going into the into the rifling but when they came out they were really good whereas all that pressure from the rifling it would distort most bullets or pretty much the majority these bullets came out pristine and that's what made them right. shoot good so it's something that you couldn't tell going in right it was okay. only coming out that they realized what made them so good well you know the bullet shape itself you know we we scream for ballistic coefficient in long range all the time like we want the slip most slippery bullets we can get well, making a bullet slippery doesn't necessarily make it accurate. In fact, a lot of time it's counterproductive. You know, the more slippery you make it, the more harder it is to tune that bullet and get it to shoot. Um, you got to find a happy medium there. And I've talked to Jaden at Lynx. He's the guy that tests all the bullet shapes they mess with at Hornady. You know, those big fat nose bullets, like the, like the, their standard boat tail hollow points and Berger makes that BT front end bullet. Normally under more of a circumstances those bullets i call them fat bullets but those bullets tend to group or are much easier to make group than the you know the the vlds or the even the hybrid bullets and the hybrids work seem to work really good and anything with that that nose design seems to work pretty good but there's something to be said about those fat ogi bullets just being inherently accurate so 
I was telling you, you know, I, I've played around with PRS and uh, I shoot the 108s in six millimeter. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> that's what that's what F class shooters shoot. Yeah. And when I, you know, now I'm shooting some 109s because I couldn't get more 108s. But uh, yeah, when I started shooting six millimeter, I started shooting 108s, and and PRS yeah. guys they would ask me because you know I mean they come up to me and they you know they want to know well, what's the F class shooter shooting, and I said 108s, right. and they're like the BC is terrible. I'm like, eh, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm I'm still not gonna hit anything. I would tell them. But yeah, <laughs> those 108s are like the easiest, most consistent bullet you can have. It's and, and that bullet I was talking about that Tom makes, they're very similar in the O Jive. Like that that O Jive, I don't know what it is. Like Jaden would always say, fat bullet shoot. So uh, they they don't they're not the slipperiest. And if you're looking for BC and flatness, and you know what the PRS guys are looking for is being able to go from target to target. And if they're off a little bit on their hold, this you know the bullets with a tighter bc you're going to hit that target more than a bullet that's dropping out of the sky a lot faster so i get what what they're going for you know in the elr game you're kind of stuck with whatever's got the longest bc best bc because you're running out of of hope at, at a certain point you know the guys that are hitting <laughs> these records god i didn't go into a tirade about like all these long records like 90 percent of the time you shoot enough at something you're going to hit it I would say that ELR is somewhat going in the right direction now because if you don't hit it in five swings, you move on to the next and you get a zero. Um, back in the day when it was just guys saying, oh, I hit this freaking piece of steel in a farmer's field at 4,000. Well, yeah, you shot freaking 900 times at it. And, you know, what kind of a feat is that? Now that they're getting somewhat repeatable, I mean, there's still been king of the two mile competitions where no one hit a target. Now this year, I think it was hit five or six, seven times, which is getting better. But until it's being hit, you know, with some repeatability all the time, I mean, I, I don't know. I just can't get into throwing expensive shit at a target and not hitting it. I, I, I you know, again, I'm uh, a lot of my F-class buddies are out there shooting that, yep. you know, like, uh, you know, the, the big one is uh, Paul Phillips, right? Yeah. Uh, but I would – you know, I was interested in just see what these guys are doing, and um, I would I would look at the King of Two Mile competition, and I look at the results, and nobody hit the two mile, and I'm like, how do you have a King of Two Mile when nobody when they didn't hit the two mile? But I I understood what they were doing, but yeah, like you yep. said, they're getting much better. They're they're, uh, which is great, but yeah, the the whole world record at 4,000 yards or whatever. And we oh, shot it. I'm on a 7,000 now. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, people send me that all the time and I'm, and I just go, okay, I've seen it. And, and maybe they just keep updating it. But, um, yeah, it's, it only took them 80 rounds. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, at least, at least they admit to that back in the day, it was, I hit this and they didn't give the whole uh, story, the whole story. How, how big the target was and how many throws they threw at it. But, I'll at least give them that. Most of these videos that are being made, they're they're saying it was hit on the seventy fifth shot or whatever. So when they first those videos start popping up, I, I you know again I I text Paul Phillips or Chase Stroud or one of these ELR guys, and I go, "Is this? How does this explain these records to me?" He goes, "That's not a record. They just, they're calling it that, but it's not." You know, and I said, "Okay, so it's unofficial." I said, "Yeah." Right. I said, "Okay, fine," but uh, I think from what I hear, they're they're starting to figure out a way to maybe have records or I think they do. They do now. And I don't there's, understand. There's a, I don't there understand. Is a world, there is a world record shoot. I believe you have to actually hit the, the target three times in a row from cold bore. And I, it's not anything distance wise, like what people are throwing videos up. I, I'm not going to, I don't want anyone to quote me on this, but I believe it's like 2200 or something, maybe now or something still pretty good feed, but yeah, it's still, I mean, that is legit, right? Hitting it three times in a row from cold bore, that, that is, that is legit. And that's what makes me think that they are going in the right direction finally, because there, there's some serious to keeping track of who's doing what, but the longest shots, I believe in competition, like on the clock in a, an actual competition is like four, like a little over 4,000. Now there's two or three people that have done it, you know, single hits at a, on a target and in a five shot string at, at those distances. So that's that's pretty good. I mean, like I said, it is going the right direction, but you'll have to give Paul some shit. I actually won a bet at one of the King of Two Mile competitions that no one would hit the two mile plate. 
when I tried to bet him some money, he wouldn't do it. So we ended up betting a Diet Coke, but he was the one going to the Coke machine, not me. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, do you, do you build the OLR rifles? Yeah, we actually build a number of them. I wouldn't say any huge numbers where we push that side of the business, but we've got a big machine for doing those guns. And, um, we built, actually we built Paul's King of the one mile guns this year. And that, that gun that won was one of our guns. Um, we built Robert Brantley's gun that won King of the two mile. Um, yeah, there's quite a few guns we built. Uh, it's not any different than building any other gun other than it's a lot heavier and a lot more bedding compound and takes, takes a bigger pipe wrench. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's, they're just hard. They're just very heavy to work with because the barrels, you know, weigh 20 some pounds by themselves. So, um, the calibers are interesting. I mean, almost everyone shoots some kind of a weird wildcat. Um, the only standalone to that would be 375 shy tech, which I guess technically is a wildcat, a really popular one. 416 Barrett is a popular one, but then there's a lot of wildcats based off those two cartridges as well. Well, everybody's trying to look for the, for an edge somewhere. Yeah. And cutting edge bullets is probably the top dog. As far as bullets go, Hornady's really come in huge strides with a cup and core bullet. In fact, oddly enough, those three longest shots in competition have been with the A tips. And a lot of that's being able to see them when those smash the ground, they leave a hell of a signature or the, the lathe turn solids kind of auger in like a, a spear would and they're a little bit harder to, to see hits. You got to be a lot better spotter on those. So I think that helps the, the shooters that are shooting a tips to, to get a second round on in, on target. They, they really splash huge on the, on the steel as well. Yeah. Do you, um, do you guys do still manual lates or you guys doing CNC? Both. Both. Um, TL, we got two TL2 Haas, CNCs and one TL1, and then I have one, two, three, three uh, Spanish knockoffs of the Morisiki manual, and then I have a, a Hardinge HVLP. Um, that's kind of my little baby. My son. I mean, I, that's my machine. It's just the one I I tended. I'd learned on, and I know its capability. But um, the CNC's got you know really you know, really good mechanism on the inside. And I believe tuning a CNC to do chambering is probably the best of all worlds. Um, and that's what we do probably 90% of our work on. The, uh, I was, uh, my guys were, uh, cause they're always, you know, having a CNC shop is you got to have a manual machine <laughs> so right. you no. can make, we've got can, quite a few, <laughs> so you can make tools for the freaking CNC machines. Uh, right. but my guys are always coming in here to using my, my, my lathe, you know, like my baby. Right. And I said, okay, guys, this, this has got to stop at some point. I said, I'm going to, I'm just going to buy a machine to put over there right. in, in, the, in the machine shop so that you guys can, can use it because I want to chamber a barrel all of a sudden it's got a freaking three jaw on it. And I got to spend an hour setting it up. I said, where it, it was always set up. Right. So, uh, Matt, my machinist, he said, uh, he said, get a, get a Haas, get a TO one. He goes, those are awesome little machines. They're, they're perfect for doing whatever he goes in. Uh, I said, yeah, a lot of, a lot of gunsmiths use that, but now TO one or TO two, I know the TO two is longer, but it is. If, if I only could buy one, I'd want a TO two just because of its capability. It's, it's distance between centers. It's, bore size for doing elr stuff you know um hole through spindle you know essentially they're the same machine one's just bigger and then of course they make all the way up to a tl4 so i mean they they make them much bigger but tl2 for if i was just going to buy one but it's really nice having a tl1 and a tl2 and in our case we have two tl2s and one tl1 um the, those two machines pretty much run all day every day <laughs> i mean they don't ever stop um, but I, I've really been happy with them. I know lots of other gunsmiths that, that just use a TL1, but they don't do the the amount of work, I guess, that we do. And they don't certainly do the big stuff that we do. Like that's, when you talk about ELR, that those those big things require some different machine or machines to work on. And the work holding's different. Everything's different. Do you guys do uh, 
uh, floating reamer holders or, or solid? Um, Rigid. Depends. Now, on my uh, hardinge, I'll use a solid. I'll go in with solid. But on the CNCs, we don't don't use rigid. We use a floating reamer holder. A little bit different than the ones that are sold for regular gunsmithing. They're they're ones that are specifically made for using on CNCs, but they uh, they work really well. The uh, dang it, I had another question. I it just went away. <laughs> dang it. Uh, okay. Uh, oh. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. Do you power feed or you uh, tail stock? Um, so the TLT, the new TL2s don't have a really good mechanism for for uh, using the tail stock. Not the way you would normally use it. Um, but of course, you know this. I'll try to explain it how someone listening would know. You can tell the in what increments to move. So like we we normally use a, a very specific uh, rougher. It's a piloted rougher that doesn't rough to like you would think a normal rougher would. Like a normal rougher is gonna rough it to within like three or four thousand a final chamber. We don't, that's not what we have. These they are more like blanking roughers. They, it blanks a 308 chamber, it blanks a, a six mil BR chamber, it blanks a 300 wind mag chamber and then the finish reamer only has to cut about maybe a third of what not even that probably a quarter of what it would have to do to finish and then we have known stop points set in the in the inside like so you touch the reamer off to the to the back of the work of the piece and then it goes into a known stopping point which is normally about 20 thou from finish and then you can obviously tell the machine to go in in 10th increments to finish the chamber out there's a reason for that you can clean the reamer off really good you know preload it with a really good cutting fluid for the finish but that last cut when the reamer makes that last final finish is the most important when it's taking it to size it's not that important but when it goes in there right at the end the reamer needs to be completely clean and we actually use a little bit different lubricant for that final cut and that way that the cut's perfect and it cuts you know, perfectly to size and the, the throats perfectly, you know, there's no chatter. It's like perfect. I think that's super important. So the way our last, I don't go in by hand on that last second. I tell the machine that to finish the chamber off and it's normally like a four tenths pass with a really, really high um, viscosity lubricant. So, um, but no, I mean, there's no way to, the tail stock on the CNC that the, the tail stocks that not even it's not even it's not automated the machine and there's it's not even graduated it's only for work holding oh, at least uh, on ours now you can you can tell the saddle to go in and there's a a, a red handle that you can turn and the saddle will move in and you can watch basically the DRO the screen for the CNC and use it like a DRO but we don't finish chambers with the wheel if that's what you're talking about we'll tell We'll take a measurement. I've got a, a device that put the headspace gauge in there. It's got a slides over the threads. Slides over the threads. And it tells me it tells me exactly I'm five thou away and I can Yep. Just offset know. offset your uh, your reamer. Yeah, the reamer already knows where it finished yeah. the last time and tell it to go home and then take four more thousands and it's nuts on every time. Do you dwell? I can't even remember the last time. Yeah, it dwells probably for two rotations of the barrel, then pops out. But um, that the one thing is if you are really and you know this accomplished CNC guy, I don't I can't even remember the last time we had to set a barrel back because we pushed the chamber in too far. Like that doesn't even happen anymore. That that happens on manuals because you wrote a number down wrong or you you jibbed when you should have jabbed or whatever. But like like that does not happen on a CNC if you like because you're measuring all the time and that last final cut such a minute amount. Like it, it just doesn't happen, but I guess there's the, the level of waste has gone down monumentally over the years in our shop because of the CNCs and having a really good guy running them. That's the main thing that, that probably, you know, like people ask me, well, why the hell did you get DMG Maury's? Why, right. why couldn't you just, I said, cause I, I, I can't afford to waste any parts. 
Right. You know, uh, like my DMGs, man, I, I move a tenth and it moves a tenth. Right. <laughs> you know, and now more, more are the shit. I mean, um, we have a, a three axis, an older Morisiki mill in the room or in the shop. And we use that for like everything, like from bolt handles to redrilling tops of receivers for 840 holes and getting them straight to putting in Seiko M16, every extractor that's ever been invented. I mean, that little machine has, I bet you that machine's made the shop two or $3 million over the years. And we, we've had it for a long time and it's an old machine, but it works as good as it did the day we got it. There's something to be said. Those machines are expensive, but they are the shit. I just yeah. don't, for for a machine for doing chambering, like like the style of stuff we do, those Haas tool room machines, because of the way they're set up and the size of them, like I don't think they can be beat. No, no, I don't know of another company that makes one that's that user friendly and and oh, oh, that yeah. size. Absolutely, for 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 barrel work or or just yeah. kind of like a shop lathe. That's yeah. that's what I'm gonna get. I, I just couldn't decide between the L one or the L two or TL one sure. or TL two. Yeah, two. I mean, if you're just going to buy one, two is the way to go, I think, just because it'll do it all. And it doesn't do it any different than the one. It's a little bit more expensive, but not terribly more. I mean, yeah, they're only like three, four thousand dollars difference. Yeah, there's there's not a big enough difference to say, OK, I'm not I'm not buying that because it's too high. It's it's just a size thing. I mean, it, it allows you to do more is what I'd say. Well, and, and now yeah. that you're talking about power reaming. That, so these were kind of calibrated questions because no, I was okay. I was looking at it and I go, well, do I need the tail stock? Because if I don't need the tail stock, then that just that's the upgrade of the machine right there. You know, because the tail right. stock is two, three grand, which is about the same well, money. Where you, where you might need the tail stock is a couple of things. Um, there's some barrels now that that you can't run through the chuck. Like the, just because they're carbon and there's not enough to hold on to, they're like the big, big barrels that are pre fluted for ELR guns and they already are fluted because they're trying to make weight. They don't sit right in the inside the machine either. So a lot of those will have to run between centers and chamber them on the other side of the, of the steady rest. So I need a tail stock for that. Yeah, so I ain't doing those, that. When you, yeah, no, I know. But you said that, hey, do you ever, chamber with the tail stock there is times when we have to and we use reamer stops that are adjustable in that way we do the same thing i'm not reading off the trying to read off the tail stock there's a reamer stop that's stopping it and then i can adjust that reamer stop for those big reamers to finish in that way but it's it's the everyday barrels like the 99 of it's done you know in the other side of the machine but if, if you're going to do some of that long between center stuff like on those big elr barrels like you You'll need it at some point. The good thing is you can always add it. Well, I mean, I have my big machines. <laughs> if I if I absolutely wanted to do a barrel, a big one, but yeah, barrel work is not something I'm planning to do <laughs> for others. This is just for yeah. myself. And but, I get you. And there's a lot of guys like you, just because you're doing enough of it, and you want to. You know, I, I know it. That's kind of how I got into it. Like I was telling you back in the when I shot a lot of high power, I initially was doing that stuff because I wanted to do it for myself. And then when my wife quit her job, I was like, well, hell, I'm, get, I'm pretty good at this. My guns shoot like a one state high power championship. So I, I, I know I know what I'm doing. Like maybe I'll build a few of these guns. Started out building high power guns for guys and morphed into what it is today. But I always say it was kind of an accident. It was never a plan. I'm going to own a big gun company and build, you know, precision rifles for the rest of the world. I, that was never a plan from the start. It just happened. I, I can identify with that. Uh, yeah. I retired from construction. I told my wife I'm done. You know, I wanted to spend more time with my family, which is something I never got to do. And 2020 I said, you know what? It's, this is about the right time to do this. You know, sure. we, I had to decide whether I had to get, my company had to double in size pretty much. Right. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to double in size. I'm, I right. think it's a, it's a good exit point, you know, leave, leave while we're at the top. And right. I said, I'm just going to buy a, a CNC machine and just make tuners and little things there. And right. six months later, I'm adding onto the shop, buying a second machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and I never planned it. So, so I'm at the point now where I'm like, everyone asks me, why, don't, why haven't you like, cause my shop's getting to where you can tell it's, it's, we're at capacity. Like, it's full and I, like, I don't have bench space. I don't have room for any more machines. And everyone's like, why don't you expand? Well, I've kind of got the point for me. 
like we're way bigger than I ever thought we would be. And the bigger we get, I mean, we're a precision company. We build precision rifles. Uh, if I add another 20,000 square feet and then hire 20 more employees, you, at some point you lose control in my head. I mean, I may be wrong, but like it's hard to, to maintain what you've always known and done when you just keep growing. Like eventually you hit that point of, of, I don't want to use anyone else's names, but you can, you end up being to a point where like you can't control every aspect of it anymore. And I'm not saying I'm controlling everything anymore, but like I, I got my eyes and face in most stuff that goes on in the shop when I'm there. And that's hard to do when you get really big. Well, what ends up happening is instead of hiring gunsmiths, you need to hire, hire managers. Right. right. Or, or you try to take your guys and to say, you guys, I need you to manage other people. Well, all of a sudden, right. that's not what they want to do. Right. No. And, and, it's, and, it's, and that's a bad thing because what, who are you going to make your managers? Most likely your best guys. Well, you want those guys building guns. And that's already kind of happened. My, you know, Josh, the guy that manages the back of my shop now, he's an excellent gunsmith and he does more managing than he does gunsmithing now, which I'd rather be honest uh, have him gunsmithing, but there does become a point where you come big enough. There needs to be management. It, the all wheels of the cog don't work when there's a lot of individuals there. You have to have someone, you know, oil in the ship and everything. And that's you know, obviously me at the top. But I, I think I'm at the point where I don't feel comfortable getting any bigger. So I've done it on purpose. Could I have gotten bigger? Of course, but I just don't feel like that's the right. And, you know, there's also a stress level that comes from that. I'm at the time in my life where I don't want any more of that. I want to relax and get ready to retire. And whether I leave the, the business to, to the guys and just let them keep running it, which kind of seems to be the, the, the avenue I, I plan on approaching. Or if someone I really trust comes in and wants to take it over, you know, who knows? I'm, I'm just at the point in my life where, like, I've done everything I can imaginably do, like, with the business like it's done more than I ever thought it would do. And it's brought a lot of joy and a lot of sense of accomplishment to me. I, I, I'm just at the point where I'd stress is not anything I need in my life anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you built a great company. There's no question about it. And, and like you said, it's, it's, you're not going to gain anything possibly by just growing bigger other than more, more stress, more headaches and possibly ruining the reputation yeah. that you work so hard to 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 obtain which is yeah, where i was at yeah and i and i know the feeling that's why i mentioned it because you you, you were almost explaining the same things that was going through my head at the time as well but now what does ga stand for <laughs> it's been a million different things in people's minds but at the time like i told you i wasn't planning on making it, it being a company it was just I had to get an FFL for what I was doing. So I had to put a name on it. And you always hear a term when you're machining or around machinists that, oh man, I got that to the Nats ass. Well, that's what it stands for. And it, people that don't spell think, well, that's spelled with an N. No, it's not. It's spelled with a G, but it stands for Nats ass. A lot of people thought it was Gardner Arms. You know, all the guys from Georgia thought I was from Georgia. I mean, it's been my dad, whose middle name is Alan, thought I named it after him. Like, it's been a million things in people's minds. But the reality of it is it's just a, a dumb machinist term, and I needed a name. And it, it, it made sense to me because everything in precision has to do with getting it to the Nats ass. So we've had fun with it. You know, we got T-shirts with, you know, bullseyes on a Nats ass. And, you know, Tom Jacobs, I don't know if he – if he did it because of me to mess with me, but his, his moniker is that you can shoot the turd off of a Nat's ass with his bullets. And like, it's kind of been a fun thing to, 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 and yeah, for the first 15 years, I didn't even really tell anybody it was because it was literally an inside joke to begin with. It never, the company was never really supposed to be what it became. It just happened. And now we just laugh at it kind of. <laughs> it's fun <laughs> george this has been amazing man i appreciate this yep oh, i'm glad you had me on it's always fun talking to guys in the industry um you know I, it's interesting talking to someone that, that started in f class because that's kind of where i started i just morphed to something that that gave me more pleasure as far as running around and shooting like the prs stuff but 
Yeah, it's fun. Maybe maybe I'll come shoot an F class mission with you sometime. Yeah, Brandley Brandley said he would. I said, okay, dude, I'm gonna bring a rifle because he's he's not far from Houston where I shoot. And I said, yeah. all right, I'm gonna bring a rifle. We're gonna we're gonna get together and you're gonna come shoot an F class match. And you know he you know he'll do it. So oh yeah, uh, he will. I'm gonna I'm gonna get him out there. So uh, now you get to nominate somebody. Who do you think I should talk to? That you think I'd have a a good conversation with. You know, to be honest, you'd have a good conversation with Trace Bartline. If you could get him on um, the story of his company and how it started is a really good one that I think a lot of people would love to hear. Um, another one that you need to do, I'll nominate two, so you got two to choose from, is, is Tom Manners, because he literally went from an industry that no one would have ever thought would coexist with with shooting and, and went into – to making composite stocks and the story there is pretty amazing as well. And some of the sub stories that go with it. So I would nominate either Trace Bartline or, uh, or Tom Manners. For well, I'll reach out to both of them. Okay. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, and they're both friends. Maybe you could get all three, all three of you on the same podcast. Like yeah, that'd be myself, fun. Myself, Tom Manners and Trace Bartline are really close. We do a lot of stuff together. So sounds like a good show. Yeah. Well, George, thank you. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Happy Merry New Christmas Year. And uh, I wish you the best, my friend. You too, Eric. Nice Take care. Talking to you. Bye-bye.